All right, Balancers, today's guest has been and is on a path to finding out what inner alchemy was required or is required to live a happy, fulfilling life of greatness. This led her to create her top-rated podcast, A Life of Greatness, where she interviews countless individuals who are dedicated to carving out lives of greatness. She now teaches, gives talks, writes about this very topic, and today we're going to try and tap into some of that knowledge that's inside of her brain, some of the information she's gathered over the years on the hows, the whats, and the whys, including tools, habits, and strategies we can leverage to achieve a fulfilled and joyous life. Sarah, it's a pleasure to have you on the Balance Series podcast today. A warm welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Erica. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, I recall reading that there was a point in time not so long ago where you experienced yourself a little bit of an initial struggle between trying to excel simultaneously at home and at life. And when we talk about life balance, sometimes it really comes down to us feeling this need and this pressure to have everything perfect or equal. And so I'm really curious to hear about your initial struggle with this, because I think it's going to resonate a lot with me and and everyone listening too. Absolutely. Well, I've got two young kids, um, an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. And when my life became very busy and I started kind of juggling a lot of different roles, it was meaning that like I was putting a lot of work into my own business, which I started up and everyone, everyone that, you know, is running their own business knows that that doesn't turn off. That's like a 24 seven kind of thing, especially when you're getting it off the ground. So, and because I love it, it was like so easy to put a lot of time into it as well. And then doing that and that was working really well, but understanding at the same time that I didn't have that time to put into my kids as much and thinking to myself, like there is that internal struggle there between wanting to dedicate a lot of time to my kids when I can, and then also wanting to dedicate time to work, which I know is fulfilling a lot of people who are listening to the podcast or reading my writing or listening to my talks or doing my course or something like that. So it's like you have these two roles of service, which are both equally as important. And which one do you do? Because both of them fulfill you. And I think for myself, I have put a lot of time and effort into my work and that it's not like it has taken priority because, of course, my kids are priority. But I know that when something slips, sometimes it is that I can't put as much time into my kids. But in the same sense, they are okay with that. And when I do put time into them, I am there and very present with them and very ready to go. And we do fun things. And I really believe that you can't have each of those those things perfect. It's it, like, it's impossible. It really is. If you're spending a lot of time doing work, then you're not spending a lot of time with your kids. So when you do spend time with your kids, how can you balance it? And like I said, it is by doing that attention, being placed straight on them, not being with them with your phone and being distracted and all that kind of stuff. Because you know what, you can be a mom that spends all her time with her kids and completely distracted, which isn't beneficial for your children anyway. So, and I I think as well, I had to do something that feel, I mean, being, filling me up by doing my other work that I do makes me a better mother as well. So it kind of works nicely hand in hand, but do I have days where I think, oh my God, like I feel terrible. I didn't realize that they had, I don't know, musical practice or this after school, or I miss like a parent teacher interview, which has happened on many occasions. (laughs) I feel bad sure but i don't i don't let that kind of stuff suffocate me where it's like oh my god i'm the worst mom and all this kind of stuff because i know that i'm not and i know that there are people around me that also help me with my children and that's also makes that fills my cup as well knowing that there are so many people out there um that are close to me that are always you know lending a helping hand so that's how I do it. It's not perfect, but I think I'm very content with where I'm at. And I see that my kids are as well. And they're so proud about what I do. It's a, it's a really sweet thing. And I think a lot of parents, you know, they worry about their kids when they're not with them the whole time and they're putting a lot of time into work. But I think it's such a nice thing for our kids to see uh, their parents working and especially doing something that makes a difference in people's lives as well. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's a lot in there I want to pull out. But the first thing I want to say is this idea of radical acceptance, right? It's accepting that. I think, and my issue with the concept of work-life balance is 
it almost forces you into a position where if you don't feel like it's perfect, then you haven't gotten it right. And when yes. you're in that loop, you're always trying to make everything equal and you're just forever chasing your tail and you're consumed by guilt, by what you are or aren't doing enough of. And you never get to that point where you can just radically accept, okay, it's not perfect, but this is what's working for me right now. And the beautiful thing about what you've shared is like, it really comes down to the quality, not the quantity, exactly. because ultimately, you know, for most people listening who work full time at minimum, they're doing 38 to 40 hour weeks, you know, and that's the bare minimum. I know for a fact that for most people, it's a lot more than that. If you run your own business, it's almost exponential, the amount of time you can spend on it. So to say, you know, to try and equate the amount of time that you give to that and then to your health or your kids is, is really unrealistic to any of your relationships as well. And it's not only that, and this is a really nice thing about balance that I've kind of learned or tried to tap into on my journey. It's that, you know, even if I had 30 hours to spend with my best friend or to spend at the gym, it doesn't make sense to equate things from a time point of view. So that's why mm. I really love the idea of being present and the quality because you just need an, a good hour of exercise every day. That's quality. You don't need endless amount of time, you know, to, to feel like it's equal. And so the same thing, like when you have the time to dedicate, as long as you are being present and as long as that's quality, then that gives back to you so much more than, you know, having endless amounts of time, like you were saying, if you were distracted. And I think this is a really good point for people listening, you know, whether you have kids or not, even as simple as after a long day of work, if you're sitting down with your family or your partner or your best friend, are you just scattered thinking about 500 things or are you present there in that conversation? Because it's crazy what an hour with your girlfriends can do to your mood after having a really bad day at work, you know, even if it's Absolutely. one hour versus a 10 hour day you've had. So I really like that. But I have to agree that there is this push and pull between, okay, I have to be mindful of how much time I'm spending doing my other things versus knowing that those things fill your cup and therefore make you better at, you know, being a parent or being a best friend or being a partner. So just, just as a, just very quickly, do you still experience that guilt? And if so, is there anything you come back to either as a reminder to self or a little tool you use to just kind of recenter yourself? Look, I think, you know, even on the weekends, sometimes I'll find myself like doing some work in between, you know, other people in my family unit doing things. And I think like, oh, I could like get this done now. But again, it goes back to like what I'm doing I love. So I'm not going, oh God, got to do that. When you work in the field that I'm in and you love it or any field that someone works in that they're passionate about, yes, you. it's like I can say like I don't want to work on weekends, but sometimes it helps me out to work, do some work on a weekend because I know maybe on the Monday that I've got to do a few – few things that are not related to work so that sure. kind of balances out things nicely and I think you just can't be so hard on yourself and I've kind of gotten over that rigid must not work on weekends must not look at the phone after 8 30 at night or you know those are not bad strategies don't get me wrong but also I don't want to be rigid in my life I just do what I think is good and yes there are great habits to have if you're falling into any unhealthy habits but I think it's also you know if we're talking kind of like personal development there's one thing to be very rigid in life and not just kind of go with the flow and if you feel like doing some work because you've got a moment on a Saturday afternoon, then why wouldn't you go do that if it is going to make it easier for you during the week? So that's kind of like how I like to work as well. Not so, not to such a formula. Yeah. I think that's a really, really good and refreshing call out. Actually, it's, it's this careful relationship with our boundaries. Like, yes, they're important. Yes, they're good to have, but acknowledge in moments where you need to be a bit more fluid. And I, I talk about this sometimes in the context of a morning routine. Like it's, it's great to have a morning routine that, you know, gets you ready for the day, but sometimes you wake up with no energy. Sometimes you wake up and you've had the worst sleep. And so mm. you have to be fluid to allow for the nuances, the ebbs and flows of life that are inevitable. Um, and, and these things are merely tools in a toolkit. You know, you don't have just two or three that always are supposed to work for you. You have, you know, a variety of things that you can turn to. And that's really, I think, what makes you a balanced human. It's not about feeling centered and like everything's okay all the time. It's actually being able to move with the ebbs and flows of life. And I think a key pillar of that is this flexibility and lack of rigidity that that you've just described. Yeah, I think that's really good 
a really like interesting thing to say as well because you need to kind of read yourself and how you're feeling. Like say, for example, last night I've just had a lot on and for some reason this usually never happens. I woke up in the middle of the night and I was thinking about the things I needed to do and then I couldn't fall asleep for a few hours and I knew I'd be exhausted. I hate when that happens. Yeah, I hate. I mean it happens to us all here and there, some yeah. people more often. And I thought if I wake up super early to do meditation, I'm going to sit in that meditation and I'm not going to be able to kind of get to the state that I want to get. So why wouldn't I like sleep in a little bit later um, to when I know that the kids are getting up and all that kind of stuff. And then I had some time after I got them all ready for school and they were off to then do the meditation after. So getting that extra hour of sleep ended up benefiting me in the long run. So that's just a great example of what we were just talking about. You need to kind of read your body and how you're feeling and where you're at at that time. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so funny you say that because last night I normally go try and go to bed around 10 p.m. And it was one of those nights I was tossing and turning a bit and it was 11.30 and I still hadn't fallen asleep. So I just pushed my alarm back. I was supposed to go for like a long walk this morning and I, because I knew that getting that extra hour of sleep was going to be more beneficial than me ticking off my exercise box first thing in the morning. You know, I can do my walk at the end of the day now, but yes. it's about having that flexibility. I do want to talk about greatness because I know that's such a big pillar of, I guess, your mission now and the work you're doing now. So can you please just share with us when you talk about having greatness, finding greatness, what are you referring to? I think for me, greatness is being your authentic self. That's one of the pillars of greatness. I think it's also leading a life where you're a kind person, where you're empathetic and also leading a life of service. And I'm not saying like, you know, you need to go and work for a charity or something like that, but in whatever you're doing, be it your job or just your day-to-day, -day, that how are you showing up and helping the people that are around you? I think that's really important as well. And those are essentially like the key, the key pillars about being a good person, helping other people on their journey and being your authentic self. Yeah, and, and what I like about this definition, because I think sometimes when we talk about these large-scale topics, you know, mindfulness, greatness, happiness, they're quite... Um, they're quite high level, but what I like about what you've just said is it's practical on a daily basis. It's something we can find on a daily basis. And what I really try and do with this podcast is make things very tangible for people. You know, I think it's all well and good to talk about these things, but I, w I was always one of those podcast listeners. I'm like, that sounds really cool, but how do I actually do it? You know, like how do I self-reflect? How do I actually do that? So do you have any like practical tips for people listening on how they can start to find or maybe uh, acknowledge their own greatness on a daily basis? I think sometimes that's the hardest part to acknowledge your own greatness. It's not something I find inherent within our human nature. I think what is one thing that I found along my journey and my studies is that greatness is within all of us. It's just that we need to work out the tools or we need to find out the tools and how to use it. It's not something outside of us and it's not something that some people have and some other people don't have. It's something that we're all born with, but how are we able within life, you know, you're born with greatness, everyone is, and then life and, you know, showing up in the world and things that can happen to us the light and the shade occur and then sometimes our greatness we move away from it when we don't mean to so how are we best coming home to that and finding what was always within us and I think one of the biggest things that I just mentioned is like how are you to be your authentic self like what who are you like I think with life like I mentioned sometimes we don't even know who we are anymore you go to school you want to be like everyone else, which is absolutely normal thing. And then we forget about what we like and what we're interested in, what makes us tick and what are our values. And I think once you kind of move out of those kid and teenage years, you start like questioning things like, what, like, who am I? And when you go back to those, like, what did I like as a child and what makes me happy when I'm doing it? You can really start to think about like, what does interest me and find, okay, I like this, I don't like this, I really like this, and then move more into that space and find out who you truly are. Another great way of doing that is through something as simple as meditation. I think meditation is one of 
the greatest things that ever happened to me in my life. And when you find a meditation that works for you, it allows you to be in a really still place. And when you're in that place of stillness, things come up for you. And when they come up for you, you allow them to kind of move through you. You acknowledge them. Unlike clouds, you let them move on. But sitting in that space allows you, again, to get to know who you are. Because a lot of the time we're rushing around in life, a million things are going on. There's so much noise in the world. And we're not able to quieten our mind and come back to our true selves. So I think, you know, being authentic and finding your way is one of the great ways that people can live a life of greatness. And another one is that being conscious of everything that you do. So conscious awareness to me was just one of the biggest pillars that I talk about. And what does that mean, conscious awareness? Conscious awareness is being conscious of your thoughts, your actions, and your words. And this means everything from like, am I going to say that remark to someone that might upset them? No, maybe I won't say that because I know that will upset them. I know that I'm having negative thoughts the whole time. How can I like rewire my brain or what can I do to make sure that my mind is not going towards the negative? Because a lot of us are wired like that. It's, you know, a caveman thing from the, you know, from when we're bored and that it's a, it's a safety mechanism, but it's obviously not something that we want in everyday life to always think the negative about everything. So what are some techniques that I can do to like move myself into a more positive mindset? And also, what am I doing? Like what actions am I doing within my life? And are they affecting me in a positive way or a negative way? And once you're conscious of all of that, then you can start changing yourself. So you can't want change in your life by being the same person. To make change, you have to change. And using conscious awareness and being consciously aware of those three things, your thoughts, what you say, and your actions, then gets you on the path to greatness and being a better person. And I think once you have all of that, then you can start living this life and you'll see things slowly start attracting to you that you want in your life as well. Because what happens is life reflects who we are, not who we want to be. So as soon as you start being a kind person, you start doing good things for other people, you start changing your bad moods to positive and thinking in a way that that can help others as well as, you know, just being kind, you'll start seeing that reflected back to you. And I think that obviously make you happier and then lead you on that path to greatness. Yeah, I I really, really like a lot of the things you've said there. What you just touched on at the end is something called the law of resonance, which mm. I've really leaned into this year. So it's moving away from, for anyone listening who hasn't heard of it, the law of attraction, um, which is when you, you know, attract the things you want. But law of resonance looks at it more from the lens of the universe or the world will resonate back at you who you are. Mm. And or so it's to get also the law of cause and effect which is yes, sure. third law. So it's the idea that like you throw a ball and then that ball, you know, will come back to you. If you throw it at the wall, it'll come back to you. And it's the same idea with the law of resonance, the law of cause and effect. What you throw out will come back to you in some way or another. Mm -hmm. And I like it because I like it over and above the law of attraction because it pushes you into this place where you do have to be aware of who you are first and foremost, rather than because I think when we use the law of attraction, and don't get me wrong, I think it has its place, but I think when we just lean into that, we almost can throw our hands up in the air and say, well, I'm just going to wait for things to happen rather than critically assess or, or be pushed to think about, well, who are we and who do we actually need to be to get the things that we want? Because that's the thing with like hitting goals and achieving milestones, leaning into our greatness, um, being our authentic selves. That's actually a version of us that we grow into and become. You know, every time you hit a new milestone in life, you achieve something new, you've become the person who's capable of doing that thing. So rather than kind of sitting on your hands and saying, well, this is what I want, I'm going to manifest it. And I think all of that is is great. But I think an, an important piece to that too is acknowledging that you actually need to make the change to receive or have the change. Um, and I think when we're having this conversation about finding your authentic self, I think this is something a lot of people struggle with. I know a lot of the listeners are very interested in 
having a side hustle and finding things that give them joy on the weekends, you know, outside of their job, which may or may not be something that they feel is totally aligned for them at this moment in time. And I think that's fine. Sometimes, you know, there are other needs we have to satisfy where we are in that position. But I think the biggest thing for me from what you've said, from kind of what I've gone through in the last couple of years as well, is just being curious, questioning Mm -hmm. things, not accepting your reality for what it is. I think when you think that your reality is what it is and it's as good as it's going to get, then that's, you know, that's what the universe is going to resonate back at you. But when you start asking questions, you know, am I actually happy right now? Does this fulfill me? Is there a better way to do this? Do I need to be doing this job? You know, just because I studied five years of law, does do I have to be a lawyer? Whatever it is, like just bring a little bit of curiosity. If you're someone listening who's like, well, I don't really know what I want to attract or what what I want to change, but I feel like something's off and it's always coming back to that feeling like, how do I feel right now in this moment? I think bringing that curiosity is such an important part of leaning into your authentic self or, or reconnecting with it, right? Because it's always within us, mm. but we do fall away from it from time to time too, right? Absolutely. And I think it's like, what is like, what brings me joy? What do I do in my life that brings me joy? Who do I hang around that brings me joy? What things do I do in my life that I walk away from and go, God, that was so fulfilling. And we all have them. So it's about really like being conscious of that and thinking about it. And when you do, you can lean more into it. Absolutely. And I think as well on the opposite, it's noting the things that don't fulfill you, that actually make you feel the complete opposite, whether that be situations, people, or things and you and, and sometimes it's a bit of a slap in your face moment when it's something you've always done something maybe you enjoyed through your 20s I remember like maybe only a couple of years ago I was out at a bar or clubbing drinking and I was like I just don't get it and like I just don't get any enjoyment from doing this I want to be in bed after 10 o'clock like okay maybe that's me getting old but I have to say, like, you do grow out of things, the things that once gave you pleasure, like things that people that used to enjoy types of relationships, like you grow and change as a person. So all those things are going to as well. But I think if you just accept that that is the way it is and you don't open yourself up to new things and you can get really stuck. Mm. Um, But, but yeah, I just, I really love this conversation because I think it's such an important part of change and, and growing as a person. Kind of related to this is, moments where we fall out of touch with our greatness, right? Mm. So like balance, life ebbs and flows. And so we might have days where we feel super connected, super grounded. We feel our greatness. We're living it out. We feel connected to our authentic selves. But there are going to be those days inevitably where we we are emotional. There are things happening beyond our control. We fall off the horse. It's, It's pretty normal. I want to know in your opinion, in either from your own life experience or really interesting people you've interviewed, what's kind of the most effective or really powerful ways we can get back to greatness in moments where we are on that down spiral? Well, it's really interesting you ask that question because I can give you an example from yesterday where it was one of those days where I was like, what is going on in the matrix? There must be some glitches <laughs> here. I had an interview at work and I and the video, um, the gorgeous video um, team, like didn't press the button to turn the video on. Like we, th- they thought Damn. it was on, which is understandable. And it was like no one's fault, but there was like also some technical difficulties and we don't know exactly actually they may have turned it on and then something happened. But basically the whole interview was done and none of it ca- was captured on video and we were like, oh, my God, okay. And then I, um, then we had to stay back late because we had an interview with someone in the UK and then they just never rocked up, right? And so yeah. then we are like, okay, great, you know, we've all stayed back late. We no email, nothing, all right. And then I get home and I'm like, you know, something had happened and I was like, uh, like thought the dog had gone missing and I was like, oh, my God, she's gone missing, we're like looking every of her and my neighbor's like, yeah, I saw her, like the side gate was left open and I saw, and she ran out and I was trying to like get her, but she was running away, all this stuff. So I was panicking. We ended up finding her. She was actually in the house, like hiding somewhere. <laughs> Thank God. So it was all fine. And I, if I chunk them all together, I would have been like, that was the worst day 
But in the same Super sense, blockbuster. yeah, I, I also thought like none of that was that bad. Like really in the scheme of life, I got my dog. That's the most important thing. Yeah, we didn't catch a video. They can have a good way of working around that. That guy didn't come on to the interview that night, but hopefully we'll still interview him again. None of these in isolation are such a big deal, but I could have made them a big deal because they were all things that didn't go the way that I had planned them to go. So how did I not get so shaken up by them? By realising that, not putting them all in a group together and thinking like this is the worst day ever, by putting them as individual things and going, okay, like if you isolate them, they're really not a big deal. Also by using the phrase, this too shall pass, things don't go always the right way. When the good happens, it doesn't last forever. When the bad happens, it doesn't last forever. And that beautiful phrase, this too shall pass, is a perfect example of that, that when we're in the darkest of the dark, to know that it won't last forever. And we're in the highest of the high, know that that also will not last forever. And when we know that life has its ebbs and flows like that, then we're okay. It gives us the strength to be able to move through the dark and it also gives us the humility to be able to move through the good things as well. And I think that's a perfect way of when we, like you mentioned, fall off the horse to know that it's not forever. It's only a little bit of life. And also most of us really learn from those times of darkness. Like life is a dichotomy. It's the light and the shade, the good and the bad. If it was always good, We would never know the bad and the good wouldn't be as good because we would Mm. know nothing else. So we need the darkness to counteract the light and for us to really appreciate it when it comes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You need that point of uh, reference. So it's, it's like anything, right? The bad relationships that you've had before you found the one or the bad jobs you had before you found the one. It's only because of that dichotomy that you know that what you've got now is is aligned and right for you. And I think something um, but, else to note, sorry, for that is no, that you. when we know what we don't want, we know what we do want. So we wouldn't we wouldn't potentially know that had we not go, gone through that bad experience. The bad experience made us go, I don't want any more of that. And now I know what I really want. Yeah, absolutely. And just kind of a little bit deeper, if we squeeze the lemon here a little bit further, in moments where we get caught in self-doubt, negative thought patterns, because those can really feel quite perpetual. And and I totally agree with kind of everything you've just said, by the way, like everything, one thing my fiance always says to me is everything's temporary. The good, the bad, everything is temporary. It's that idea of this too shall pass. And what really defines us is not what happens to us, but how we react to it, how we move on, like what's, what's your next step after the thing happens. So in moments where we feel a little bit pinned down by self-doubt, negative thoughts. I feel like that can be quite a perpetual state sometimes. What, how do you kind of deal with those moments when they come up, assuming they do? Yeah. When you have a negative thought, the first thing that I do is like test it out. Do I know 100% this is true? And 99.9% of the time, you will not know 100% that to be true. And it won't be true. So it's like, okay, well, I'm thinking this thought, it's not even true. So why am I so worried about it? It's it's not even happening. Or you might even think of like a scenario. You might have created a scenario in your head between you and your boss because you read an email and the email seemed negative, but you don't 100% know. You were just reading it in a tone that you interpreted it in that might not even have been like written like that. And so then you're driving to work so furious and you're already working out, playing out the scenario in your head between you and your boss and what you're going to say to him or her and how, and you feeling the emotions. And, you know, you're, you're almost like we said, attracting that to you, getting to work and you're already in a bad mood. And then you're, you're firing at your boss and he's sitting there thinking to himself, like, I don't even know what she's going on about. So you have created this whole song and dance around something that didn't even exist. So I think the first thing is to like, is this actually true? Do I know this for sure? And 99% of the time, absolutely, you will not know it for sure and it will not be true. So I think, yes, we can get stuck in those negative cycles, 
But another way to do it is also like flick the switch. Like, what can I do? Okay, I'm having this negative thought. What's a way that I can move to a positive thought? And, you know, something that I have worked with that I think is very effective is when we have a positive, like think of something in your life that brings you joy. It might be your partner. It might be your cat. It might be a work colleague or some a project you're working on. Know what it is already. So when that negative thought comes up, you're switching to the positive one. You could be doing that 70 times a day, but soon your brain will rewire itself to go to the positive instead of the negative. So again, it's about being conscious, as I mentioned earlier, of your thought patterns. And as soon as you get into a negative rut, being able to firstly question, is this true or not? And then being able to shift that so you don't get stuck in it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of like, what you were saying before, right, when you had the three things happen in your day yesterday and collectively it felt really bad, I think if you were in that position, right, the first thing happens, then you start being negative. Like you go through the whole day and you're like, that was just the worst day ever and you sit in that. Then it's almost like your brain is now in that state of being and that's kind of what you're reflecting out. So then the next day you kind of find, I find like when things go wrong or having a bad moment in life, it, it can be almost like a string of things. And I feel like you almost then just position yourself to look for those things. So I think it's really important when when we're talking about this in the context of negative thoughts to try and break that cycle. And Mm. it's not the simplest thing to do, especially if you're you're talking like 20, 30, 40 years of you having similar roadmaps or or neurological fired pathways in your brain that tell you the same thing when you have the same response. But awareness and and just trying and, and stretching and strengthening that muscle which is your brain to think in a different way it takes time and persistence but you can do it and Absolutely. That, it's so simple to just say here's the thought is it true like I think I guarantee if that's the one thing that everyone listening to this episode right now does it will be very profound because you will actually like what we were saying before bring that curiosity to things that you just accept as a status quo, as part of your life. And that's where change happens because you move away from that autopilot to, okay, well, what can I actually bring different to the table? And mm. and that's the nexus of self-awareness as well. I but think Sarah, it's easy for everyone to sit in misery as well. So it's an easy, it's easy to be miserable. And, and if you, if you can say you want to change, but when you actually do, you have to put effort in. So you, and it's often you know, uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. And and people might look at you going like, hold on, that's not that miserable person that I know. But if we want to change, we need to put the work in. And so the work might be like doing that thing where you're consciously changing your thought patterns to a more positive one or questioning whatever your negative thought is. But this stuff does take work. So if you want to change, you need to make the change. Absolutely. I don't have anything to add to that. But Sarah, I want to thank you so, so much for coming on the show today, downloading your knowledge, sharing in a conversation with me because I've learned a lot and I know the listeners would have gotten a lot out of our chat. So thank you very, very much. And for people wanting to connect with you, check out the podcast. I mean, I'll pop links to the podcast in the show notes, but if they want to connect with you in any other way, where's the best place? And I'll put some links as well. So my podcast is A Life of Greatness and you can find that on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Um, I've got a manifestation course and meditations that I sell on my website at sarahgrimberg.com or my Instagram, which is Sarah Grimberg. They're the best ways. Amazing. Perfect. I'll pop all those in the show notes, but thank you so, so much for your time. Thanks for having me.